Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Welcome to the Bottle Yard Studios here in Bristol. Last night, another shocking attack on the streets of the capital, only a week after a terrorist attack in Manchester. Today, the normal rules that guide general election campaigning were put on hold. This evening, that campaign was resumed. Tonight, you're going to hear from the co-leader of the Green Party, Jonathan Bartley, and also the leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party, Paul Nuttall. We'll hear from him in just a moment, but please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Jonathan Bartley from the Green Party. Welcome to the programme. In the light of the tragic events last night, Theresa May held a special security meeting. We know it as Cobra at Downing Street. She said that the country needs to change its complete take in the way that it deals with extremism and tackles terrorism. Do you agree with her? I will answer that, Joe. Just, just in starting, I just want to say my thoughts uh, are very much with those that were hurt, those that were killed and their families uh, last night. Um, and a true pay tribute to the emergency service. He did, he did amazing work last night. <laughs> The, I think what I watched what Theresa May said, and I think uh, she is right to call for a, a review. And I think that review has to have two very important aspects to it. The first is uh, the prevent strategy. Uh, we've seen a certain degree of success in the prevent strategy. That's the counter radicalization strategy the government has been pursuing for a, a number of years. But it is clearly toxic to some communities. It is alienating some communities. And therefore, we are not getting to the root of the radicalization. We're not building the bridges. We're not getting the intelligence that we need. In the second area, I want her to look at policing. We've seen 20,000 police officers lost uh, since 2010. That has to be addressed. But it isn't just about police numbers. It's also about the way we police. I'm chair of my local ward panel where I live in South London and we set the priorities for local policing and I know that police officers can't be in every place at every moment. They require that wonderful tradition that we have in this country of policing by consent. They need to work with the community, they need the intelligence from the community and I want to see that front and centre in the review that Theresa May pursues. You actually called the prevent strategy, you called it xenophobic. Why is it xenophobic? It, it, it's xenophobic because it is alienating communities and I think we need to be absolutely clear for those that would try and tarnish the Muslim community with these kinds of atrocities. This was not down to the Muslim community. This is a perversion of Islam. <laughs> with, with the toxic... I'm sorry you're saying rubbish. I, I disagree with you, man. I'm sorry. But, with you. And, and we'll and come that's to you in a here, moment and you can great. put your hands up and you can um, question Jonathan Barton. But it is, it is alienating the very communities that we need to be building bridges with. You know, think of yourself being a family, maybe you have a family member that you're worried at risk of radicalisation. What are you going to do? Are you going to trust the authorities? Are you going to trust the strategy? Are you going to uh, bring this to the attention of the authorities? Because you know, extremism is really, really complex. All Radicalism right. is very, very complex. There is, you know, we need an evidence-based approach, but the, the op it isn't a clear, pat answer to why people become radicalised. It happens in many, many ways, and we're just getting to the bottom of it. Well, we need that Well, may raise the issue of actually changing our whole strategy. Let's go to the first question at Jeff Davis. Ask your question to Jonathan Barton. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Following last night's terror att terrorist attack, do we need to be armed to protect ourselves or shut our borders? Um, the answer is, uh, let, let's, uh, knee-jerk reactions, okay, are not the best way to respond in contexts like this. It's good that the Prime Minister has started to talk about reviewing the strategy. Um, we have armed police officers uh, on the street. The question that we're going to have to face in this general election, you know, will elect a parliament and a government that will have to look at these issues about whether we arm police officers further. My instinct, and I, you know, let's see what comes out of the review that happens from these particular incidents. I know that the police responded very, very quickly in this particular example. Um, but my instinct is not to arm all our police. But let's see. Let's see what happens. All right. 
Does anybody, does anybody want to come in on the back of what Jonathan Bartley has just said in response to what he calls no knee-jerk reaction? Anybody want to comment? Here you were saying and booing at the beginning. Yes, gentlemen there. I don't think it's a knee-jerk reaction. The BBC two years ago carried out a survey of Muslims in this country and it found that 26% of Muslims in this country support the terrorist attacks in Europe and this country and they hold our own democracy in contempt. It needs to be sorted. Jonathan. I, I'm not familiar with that survey, but you know what? There are some liberties and freedoms uh, in this country which I am absolutely passionate about protecting. And actually, I think it's what the terrorists want to do away with. It's what they want to attack. Uh, and so when it comes to having a knee-jerk reaction, uh, which is to suddenly clamp down on civil liberties. You know, look, we've just seen Trump elected in America. You know, it's not out of the question that we can have someone of that caliber <laughs> elected in, in this country. What would they do with powers that can be used to abuse and clamp down on civil liberties? So, Jonathan, why, why has the Green Party not supported the terrorist legislation that has been put forward by the government over the years? You're not prepared to take any action, are you? We're, we're very much about scrutinising the, the government's plans. You know, the job of Green MPs is to scrutinise what the government is doing, and that's what we have done as bills have passed through Parliament. But when you have groups like Liberty, when you have groups like uh, National Union of Teachers, when you have civil society groups coming forward and saying that things aren't working, when you have lawyers groups coming forward and saying this is a potential infringement on civil liberties, you have to listen to them. Let's listen to the people who are working at the coalface that know about this stuff. Let's be led by them and let's be representing them in Parliament. That's what the Green Party so you, will do. So you wouldn't be in favour, for example, of taking away the safe spaces on the internet for extremists to actually publish some of their hateful ideology. So there, there are two issues that come up around technology. Uh, the first one, and let's just caveat this with politicians often get very nervous when talking about technology because they don't really know much about it. Okay, and they're often... Is that you included? I include that. I include myself in that. Um, I think we need to uh, be calling uh, providers uh, of services. They, they call themselves platforms like Facebook, um, but actually they are also publishers and we need to be calling them to account and I would like to see them publish uh, the uh, details of what they've taken down, when they've taken down and Theresa May did flag this in her speech and I think right. we might need international cooperation Let's around Let's get it. some more reaction for the audience. The gentleman there. Well, when this gentleman said there's 26% of Muslims agree with ISIS, etc. I mean, that is a large amount of people and it's getting bigger by the minute. Do people realise in this country, within 20 to 25 years, and people are going to be shocked at what I'm going to say, that Muslim will be the population but majority in this country the right, we have two children they have ten then we have eight four we have a hundred well you're making a lot of years. assumptions of course so, but uh, but but you know, is, answer the point this is a perversion of islam this is not a problem that muslims have to deal with it's a problem that we all have to deal with <laughs> i look, I live in an area that is diverse. I live close to two mosques. I spend a lot of time going to the mosques and talking with people. There are people in those mosques that hate what's happened last night, the terror, the radicalization, as much as I do. I'm worried for their children as much as I'm worried for my children. But that's I want to, we that's need to work with them. percent don't like it. You've still got 26% of Muslims that do agree with ISIS and killing British people and killing I'm ourselves. I'm sorry, I just do people. not accept that. I'm sorry. All right, well, let's take, let's take uh, another comment from the lady here in the front row. Um, I, I would have to say that, um, first and foremost, I completely and sincerely empathise with people's fear of terrorism, full stop, irrespective of religion and irrespective of ethnicity. However, um, acts of violence, terrorism and crime are not something that is restricted to a religion. It, there is truth that ISIS is indoctrinating vulnerable, somewhat loner criminal people to act in the way that's affecting our society now, but it is dangerous to apply a rigid framework just to one religion when Brevnik, for example, in Norway, politically murdered the future politicians of Norway and no one referred to him as a terrorism because his skin is white. Right. Well, that's the interesting point. That's a very interesting point. And thank you very much for making that important point because, of course, one in four referrals uh, through the counter-terrorism uh, procedures uh, is, is from far-right Did you terror. consider the murder of Joe Cox, the MP, as a terrorist incident? Um, I would consider it as an incident of terror. I think it was designed to strike terror, yes. Right, the gentleman there, and then we're going to move on to a different subject. Yes. Um, yeah, well, I mean, Islam's been here for 600 years, and we haven't had a problem for 600 years. But I, I'm more interested in your view on Saudi Arabia and the Wahhabi background to Islam. 
um, and the close ties behind the Saudi government and our arms sales. Um, I think you know, foreign policy has been raised by Jeremy Corbyn, and I think we need to take that into account. Yes, I, I want to see the Green Party would end commercial arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, so Jonathan Barley, the Green Party has also been against pretty well every foreign intervention. You wouldn't even support the idea of a drone taking out an extremist jihadi, even if they were British, somewhere abroad. Well, as you know, Joe, it's going to be a matter of international law. You know, that could be illegal. You have to take every case on a case-by-case -case basis. But let's not pretend that those incidents, those decisions happen in isolation. They don't. They have consequences for radicalisation. They have consequences far and beyond that particular act. There may be more people come up in their place. So you've got to take these things very, very seriously when you do make those decisions. Right, but you wouldn't support if you had information. It depends on the situation. I mean, All right. I can't do that. Let's move on to the next questioner, Will Walker. So, your party is proposing a four day working week. And what I want to know is what evidence do you have that this will benefit the economy? Well, I mean, Will, it's a, it's a great question. I'm really glad you flagged it because this is one of the big issues I think we need to be talking about in this election because it's very short term. We need to be looking at the long term. What's going to happen with automation in 20, 30, 40 years that will potentially take away millions of jobs? And um, what's interesting is that we work, and there'll be people you know, here watching this program at home with that rising feeling in their stomach right now that they're going to have to go into work tomorrow morning on Monday. Think about that. You might not have to have that under a green government. <laughs> How much would it cost? But, um, we want to phase it in over a, a long, long time. You've got people like Amazon already talking about doing it. You've got France dropping to a 35-hour week. You've got other people talking about flexible working. Mm. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. But, sure. you know, 100 years ago... Gerald Ford uh, uh, said, let's have a, si a five-day week, not a six-day week. Right, uh, when you say Henry it's not going to happen for a long Ford, time... Not Gerald Ford, the President, Henry Ford. <laughs> Slightly <laughs> and, and different. When you say said, it's going to be phased in over a long... You do that, but we can do it. Yeah, but if it's going to be phased in over a long time, what are you talking about, 100 years? I mean, no, are people no, no. voting for something no. that just isn't going to happen? No, this is... Uh, we need a bigger conversation about the economy, and let's move it as quickly as we can. It's not going to happen overnight, but if you've got companies coming forward and pointing out, look, we've got the lowest productivity uh, in, in Europe, we work the longest hours, we're racking up a huge bill for the NHS in terms of stress and substance abuse as a result of overwork. You know what? It does not have to be like this. Let's think in new ways. Let's start to have that conversation and see what we can do. Who fancies a four-day week? <laughs> do people in the audience think it's affordable? Gentlemen there. I'll just go back to that point you were saying about um, automation. I mean, this has started 30 years ago. In fact, when I started, we're, there were typing pools with 20 women in typing or, or men. Now it's all done on a word processor. Going forward, we cannot create any more jobs. Jobs are being taken by technology. They're being taken by robots. In my, my industry, motor trade, robots build most of, most of the cars now. People are going off. So can you tell me where these jobs are supposed to be com coming from in the future? Well, that, Before that, you answer, let's point. just take yeah. a few more comments from the audience and then we'll get anybody else who wants to say yes. The gentleman here in the front row. Uh, do you think that universal basic income might be a, a potential route forward um, with automation? <laughs> yeah. um, to have so many people applauding that question, it seems like you know, the, the idea is, is getting through. It is an idea that's come. For those that don't know, universal basic income would be a rejig of the welfare state. The welfare state was set up... 1945, 67, uh, under a very different set of assumptions. Uh, we're now seeing a real attack on the welfare state from one side by this government and dismantling of it, and then uh, on the other side, it's really not fit for purpose in many senses because of the assumptions it was based on. A lot of people using food banks are doing so because a problem with their, with their benefits. How much would it be? Um, it depends on how much progressive taxation you want. Right. Uh, well, or you want, or you're proposing, <laughs> um, Jonathan Barley. I mean, the thing is, who would be paying for this? Well, at the moment, it would be a rejig of the welfare state. What we want is a pilot to see it work. In other countries in the world, they're starting to pilot this scheme. So in Ontario, in Canada, places on the continent, they're working out, and that's the way you have to do it. it you know, when Ian Duncan Smith started to amalgamate six benefits into universal credit, he fell about six or seven years behind schedule. It's a big thing to do. So you pilot it, you work out how it's affordable, and then you roll it out. Gentleman here. Yes, thank you. You're standing up there talking about a four-day week, but this country is run, the backbone of this country is a small business. Who's going to compensate the business owners for having to pay the same wages but with less productivity? Well, well the idea is that you get, more, you get more productivity per worker when you don't work such long hours. And that's why companies are thinking about this might be a good thing. But, you know, there's a bigger question that we, we should face. You know, 30 years ago, uh, when I was growing up, not so long ago, we were told that we would have uh, lots of technological advance. We would have huge wealth created. We would all be able to work fewer hours, enjoy time with our friends and family. You know what? We've had that wealth created, we've had that automation, but what we've seen instead is growing inequality. It doesn't have to be that way. 
how do you explain how do you explain then the high levels of employment um, there are criticisms that it might not be the right kind of employment but are you saying that high levels of employment are not desirable because that's what we have well, look at look at the the kind of employment that many of us uh, are experiencing at the moment zero hours contracts really low wages insecure employment access to tribunals when things go wrong taken away we can't afford the justice because we can't afford the fees to go to the tribunals and what's going to happen in the context of brexit potentially with this government where we use it as an opportunity to once again wage a fresh assault on workers rights you know that we're in a new age of insecurity uh, in this country with our working practices we have to do something different and you know what there is the money the problem is the money in the wrong is in the wrong hands it takes the political will to go and ha make it happen any more reaction from the audience Yes, the gentleman here. The 35-hour uh, week in France has been in force for some years, and the new president of France, Macron, wants to stop it. Why do you think it will be successful here? Um, I'm not familiar uh, with what Mac Macron said about the 35-hour working week and, and what his reasons are for it. But, I mean, the idea of the working week being shorter is that there is a lot of wealth, uh, we haven't seen in this room enough of it. We've got big corporations that are making excess profits. We have a government that is cutting corporation tax lower and lower and lower, so they are getting more and more and more of the pie, and we're not seeing the benefits. And we can be better than this. We can transition the economy where we create good jobs. And that's the, the important thing that the Green Party is also saying, is that we need to transition the economy down to more resilient local economies, where we're keeping money flowing in the local economies rather than being sucked out by the big multinationals. You know, when you spend a pound in an independent shop, the majority of that money stays flowing in the local economy. When it goes to a chain store, it leaves the local economy. It makes sense to, to, to uh, encourage and produce local economies that are resilient in the, in the winds of globalization, absolutely. The gentleman here. <laughs> you, you mentioned creating good jobs, and of course we all want good jobs, but what's the Green Party actually going to do to create these good jobs? How's the four-day working week as opposed to a five-day week actually going to create Good jobs. It's all very well in opposition to say we'd like these things, sure. but what are you actually going to so take good, action to do? Good jobs. Great question. Good jobs. How do we create them? Uh, we've got plans to create a million new jobs, and much of that, we think, can come from a renewable energy revolution, a green industrial strategy. So the New Economics Foundation reckons that we can generate over six times, six times our annual electricity consumption just from offshore renewables. Now, we're about to put... Labour supports it, the government supports it, about to put a £30 billion subsidy into Hinkley nuclear power. Now that will generate in the long term 800 jobs. You take that subsidy, put it into a renewable energy revolution, you rejuvenate your coastline of the UK, you create tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of good jobs. That's the way to spend money. And you need a five-day working week to do that, I'd imagine. Well, if you've got more jobs, if you've got more productivity, why? Why don't we push up the living wage? minimum wage to a living wage standard. You know what? We can afford it. Have you talked to business about this? Yeah. Are they in favour of putting up the living wage even further? Well, of course, you get savings from a living wage because you get less uh, in-work benefits that you have to pay out. You get an increased tax and national insurance take, and that money can be circulated back to support businesses. Right. We're going to move on to the next question from Mitchell Cole. Um, can we go to Mitchell? Yes. Um, you just mentioned a minute ago, and I saw it in your manifesto as well, that you wanted to end subsidies for nuclear power, which doesn't actually contribute to climate change. So how can you justify you know, wanting to be green when we've got pretty much a perfect solution there where it generates huge amounts of power with very little damage to the environment? Well, it's not really a perfect solution, is it? When you think about the massive investment, you think it's locking us into a deal for years to come with, at a strike price that is already more expensive than offshore wind. It's a centralised system which keeps control in a very small place, makes us security-wise quite vulnerable. We could have an alternative about decentralising the supply. You know, what, what would it, wouldn't it be great if, like in my local community in, near, near me in Brixton, you had a community project uh, like Brixton Solar, where local people invest in an area of low interest rates, they get a return on their investment of maybe about 5%. You put solar panels on the top of a housing estate, that generates clean energy, which goes back into the local community, and the profits are put into uh, insulation and cutting uh, fuel poverty. That makes sense. Why not roll, roll, roll it out right around the UK? That's the kind of thing that we can do. Right, because it'll keep the lights on, I suppose, is what people will argue. Are there any questions on energy, on nuclear energy and renewables? I mean, one of the biggest problems uh, for voters are the fact that their energy bills are going up. They also don't like any green subsidies being on their bills. How do you tell people that actually that is why, in part, 
their bills have gone up. You know what, that's a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> if you look at uh, the, the, the fossil fuel subsidies, £6 billion this government subsidises fossil fuels. You want to know why energy prices are going up. Look at the big six energy companies. Every time the wholesale price of energy goes up, they put up their prices. Then the wholesale price of energy goes down, they don't drop their prices nearly enough. We were told that privatisation of energy was going to cut our bills. You know what, it hasn't delivered. It's time to bring them back into public ownership. Anybody want to respond on that in terms of bills? Yes, you asked the question. Did you want to comment? Well, yeah, you, you say it's cheaper to go renewable, but is it anywhere near as reliable as something like nuclear power? Because the mass amounts of power we need for modern-day society, because we can't just ask everybody to change their lives. We know that. When it stops being windy, we don't get wind power. When it stops being sunny, we don't get solar power, whereas we can always smash a couple of atoms into each other. <laughs> it always works, <laughs> and it's safe. With the greatest respect, that, that is kind of in the industry increasingly considered a, a 20th century argument. You've got people running the national grid saying, you know, every house, every community can be a, a powerhouse. I went to visit uh, Cardiff Bay recently to look at where we could have uh, use of uh, the, the, the bay there to create where you hold back the water and then you drop it at the time that you need the electricity supply. Now, six of those up the west coast could generate as much power as Hinkley. That's the kind of capacity that we could be developing. But it doesn't talk about consistency it. and reliability. Well, no, how you drop it when it you need the electricity, so you have absolute control over right, it. Right, but how much would it cost to renationalise the national grid? Uh, I couldn't give you a figure off the top of my head. Right, so what you're I saying do to people here you to develop... support a policy that you no, haven't costed. If... <laughs> uh, I couldn't give you this figure off the top of my head because I haven't got it in front of me, I haven't got the notes, I'm afraid, Joe, but I can go and find it out for you after the programme very, very happily. And how would the it work? The point is, it will uh, save consumers money. It's the right thing to do in terms of accountability, but it's also coupled um, with that renewable energy revolution around the, you know, it's not a, it's not a panacea, it's something that we should be moving towards, but let's have a decentralised energy supply like Germany. We know that's cost effective. We know that that makes money. We know that gives back to the community. Why wouldn't you do it? Donald Trump, of course, has pulled America out of the Paris Agreement, an agreement he said was voluntary anyway. Yes, clear your, where you stand there on that issue. But he, of course, said it was a voluntary agreement. It wouldn't have mattered whether he'd met those targets or not. What's the point of those international agreements? Well, the point of the, the Paris Agreement, and you know what? Um, when we heard Theresa May, I just want to make this point, on the uh, debate the other night uh, revealed the details of the conversation with Donald Trump. I think that is such weak, weak, weak leadership. What did, um, she, what did she say? Um, she basically said, uh, she picked up the phone, Donald, Donald said, I'm leaving the Paris Agreement. She said, well, we're not. I don't think it's a great idea, but thanks a lot. And what would you have done? I would have said, well, I can't repeat it here on no. live TV. Bearing <laughs> uh, in mind the audience. you need to bleep it out. Um, but I think you, you have to say this is totally unacceptable. It's economically illiterate. It's, uh, it's uh, environmentally illiterate. It's scientifically illiterate. It's entirely the wrong decision. You asked me the question, why we should be in the Paris Agreement? Because you know what? Climate change doesn't stop at the border. We have to work with other countries if we're going to get those commitments, those agreements. What it does is sets a framework, it sets a direction for local business, uh, for those people that are making that energy transition. It's interesting, isn't it, that it was the big corporations who are investing in this energy that went to Trump and said, look, you're throwing us right off course by doing this. You're giving us the wrong direction. They need a steer. If we're going to make this transition, we need a player like America involved and at the table. Well, let's move to our next question because it's about whether the Green Party can enact any of the proposals that are in their manifesto. Let's go to Michael Dunn, please, for the next question. So should Green Party voters vote tactically and vote Labour to stop the Conservatives winning a majority? So your Progressive Alliance, it's died on its feet, hasn't it? Well, in about 30 seats around the country, we have stood aside. And you know, one thing I'm really, really proud about the Green Party is that we look beyond tribal politics and we believe we should act in the interests of the country. Um, but you know what? At this election, where there's a Green candidate, I want you, Michael, I want everyone else to be voting Green, because I think we're at a fork in the road. Now, you're going to hear from Paul Knuckle in a minute. Uh, he is taking the country, uh, even though he's got no MPs at Westminster, he's taking the country down the wrong road. He said, his party has said to the government, jump, and the government has said, how high? They are pursuing an extreme Brexit, which will take us in the wrong direction as a country that will build walls, not bridges, that will be inward-looking, not outward-looking. If you want an outward-looking, inclusive vision that is unapologetically standing up for freedom of movement, uh, that will make the right decisions over, for example, Trident nuclear weapons, where Labour's policy is, frankly, a shambles, vote for the Green Party. This is what's at stake. Please cast your vote for the Greens. So why have the other parties not gone in on the Progressive Alliance? 
Sorry, if I hear Why that. have the other parties not gone in on this progressive alliance? No one has signed up to it no, officially, I mean, it's, and it's, you're it's, standing aside in about 30 seats. It's, it's extremely disappointing. We, I wrote with my co-leader Caroline Lucas uh, to uh, Tim Farron, to Jeremy Corbyn, right at the beginning of the election, and said, please come and talk about it. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't reciprocate. But you know what? Sometimes you have to make the first move. Sometimes you have to show leadership. And I'm really proud that we showed that leadership. How big a problem is it that your proposals, in many ways, are so similar to Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party? Well, uh, you know, with, uh, there are areas of common ground. Most and, of it. And, and, no, not most of it. Mm. Uh, but, you know, where's the commitment to proportional representation in the manifesto? Why is he... <laughs> Why is he spending £110 billion renewing nuclear weapons, which he said he'd never use, when we could be giving a kiss of life to the NHS? Uh, you can't tackle air pollution and pursue a programme of airport expansion and road building as Labour Party wants to do. So why are you standing aside in so many seats? Because we believe that in this current context, this government is so dangerous, would be so bad for the future of Britain, that we're going to have to suck it up in a few seats. And I'm not saying it's easy, it's painful. But you know what? I think it's the right thing to do. Except you're only polling, of course. Your polling figures are extremely low, lower than in 2015. You're not cutting through. Well, we, I think we know what's happening in this election. This is a very tactical election. It can't be denied. We are in a broken electoral system which pushes everyone towards two parties. So when you get an extreme situation like we have now, uh, with this government pursuing a very extreme path, and, you know, to his credit, Jeremy Corbyn's bold manifesto, shaking up the debate. You know, I, I want to give him some praise here. Um, he's shaking up the debate. In 2015, we were the only ones saying austerity, austerity right. isn't necessary. Now, Labour are saying in their manifesto, austerity isn't necessary. <laughs> Let's go back to the questioner. What's your response? So, as you know, some of the seats in Bristol are very marginal. And, I, obviously, I've voted Green before, and I, I really respect some of the policy you're putting out, but it's just, it seems so close. So, you know, voting Labour just seems like the logical thing to do in this election. Yeah, well, in a place like Bristol West, where it looked be very close between Greens and Labour, you know what, you can vote with your heart. <laughs> you really can. Uh, and, you know, as Greens, you know, we will work with Labour, if there's a minority Labour government, on a case-by-case -case basis where there's common ground. You know what, in real life, outside the Westminster bubble, um, when you see common ground, you work with other people to further your common interests. I don't know why on earth we don't do it in politics. Let's go to the lady here in the front row. Thank you. Does that mean if you have MPs that you would push Jeremy Corbyn or Miss May to um, adopt a proportional representation system? Absolutely, we would push uh, for a proportional representation system. Um, when you get Green MPs in Parliament, what you get, if we have a Conservative government, you will get them really holding the Conservatives to account. If we get a Labour government, you'll get us holding Labour's feet to the fire and making sure they deliver on those manifesto promises and actually push them towards those bold ideas, like the four-day week, like basic income, uh, like scrapping Trident, like proportional representation. You know, if you want a vote that really matters, the Green Party's the vote. Right, let's go to the, uh, no, the lady at the front, actually, first of all, and then we'll go to the gentleman at the back. Given that um, the Green Party aren't going to be forming the next government, what difference do you think it will make to have two or three extra Green MPs alongside Caroline Lucas? What can they do that one sure. Green MP can't well, yeah. do? I'm absolutely right, and I'm going to put my hands up, Joe. I say, you know, probably I won't be walking into 10 Downing Street on the 9th. Thank you for That's being realistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but can you imagine, uh, yeah, the, you know, in 2015, according to our vote share, under a fair voting system, we would have had 24 MPs in the House of Commons. Imagine 24 Caroline Lucases in that House of Commons. It would shake up politics in no uncertain terms. Whether you're Labour or Lib Dem or Green, you know that's true. The lady over there, and then, sorry, I'll come back to the gentleman there. The lady there in the front row. Um, by your logic, and I, I support it in part, how many UKIP representatives would we have? <laughs> you know what, uh, I'm a Democrat, uh, and you know, the Greens are the antithesis to UKIP. And you know what, we're, we're polling pretty close to UKIP at the moment, and if you want to finish off UKIP forever, vote Green. Let's get us above UKIP, and let's put them in. <laughs> That's another reason. <laughs> I'm afraid this, that's all we've got time for. Jonathan Bartley, please show your appreciation again for the Tony Blair. You are free to go. Now, 
Now, you're watching a special election question programme here in Bristol. Remember, you can join in the discussion on Twitter by using the hashtag BBCDebate. Thank you to our studio audience there for their support for Jonathan Bartley answering the questions. I can now welcome the leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party. Please show your appreciation for Paul Nuttall. Paul Nuttall, I'm going to start with the same question that I put to Jonathan Bartley just a short while ago, and that's your response to what Theresa May has said in the light of the events last night, the shocking events on the streets of London, that she thinks the country needs to have a completely different approach to extremism and terrorism. Do you agree with her? I do agree with her, actually. Uh, it's something I've been calling for uh, for quite a long time. Um, the, it's quite interesting to hear Theresa May finally identify what the problem is because we've had politician after politician in this country who's refused to accept that the problem is an Islamist ideology. Now Islamism isn't Islam, it's not about Muslims. Islamism is a political ideology, it's an ideology of violence and I was glad to hear Theresa May today speak about Islamist extremism because that is at the heart of the problem. What are you proposing though in concrete terms? Well, firstly, what we need to do is we need to uh, ensure that there's more police officers on the beat. We want to see 20,000 more police officers because we believe community policing is important. If people are going to pass on information, they're more likely to pass it on to a policeman within their local community. Equally, what we need to see is the Muslim community itself sign up to the PREVENT programme because at the moment, only one in eight referrals to PREVENT come from within the Muslim community. But you, support, you support the prevent. Yes, I do, I, but obviously there is a breakdown of trust, and what we need to do is to rebuild it. And set, finally, I think we also have to look at the Saudi or Qatari funding of mosques. Saudi Arabia basically spread hatred and radicalism and violence around the globe, and we have to look at the funding of, of mosques in this country All by right. Saudis and Qataris. L let's take our first question from the audience, from James Carmichael. James. You recently said that detention without trial should be considered for terror suspects. Isn't this fundamentally against British values of justice? What I said is that nothing should be taken off the table. I also spoke about return to control orders and tagging because, look, the, uh, the safety of British civilians and last night and Manchester and indeed the Westminster attack uh, proves this is more important than the human rights of any would-be jihadi. And what we have to do is accept that we're now living in a different world. We're living in a dangerous society. The, there are a small group of people in this country, and it is small, who hate the way we live, hate who we are, want to destroy our democracy. And, you know, the, the Muslim community itself are victims here, because the vast majority of Muslims are peaceful, they add to our culture, they add to our economy, but there's a small number, and I've called radical Islamism a cancer that needs to be cut out, and it is. All right, let's, let's take some more comments from the audience. Does anybody want to come back? Yes, the gentleman there in the front row. Yeah. Hello, Paul. Paul, um, what is your attitude to places like Tower Hamlets, where you've got groups of young Islamic men wandering around telling people what to do, basically? Yeah, I mean, it, it should be made perfectly clear uh, that there is one law in this country, and that is British law, and people should sign up to British values and a British way of life. Well, what would you do about it? Well, it should, sim <laughs> it should simply not be accepted within British society, and these people should be told loud and clear that there is one rule, one law, you sign up to it when you're in this country. And if you break the law, though, you, you go through the criminal justice you, system. You so, do. What are you, so what are you suggesting? There's nothing different. You know, well, what's going on is that these people are verbally telling people to, to cover up and whatnot. You know, they're not necessarily breaking the law. However, they need to be told and it needs to be made clear you're in Britain and you sign up to British way of life. And, and internment is the answer, is no, it? No, I didn't say that. No, I'm talking about internment. I, I, actually, I also mentioned waterboarding, by the way. Mm. And I mentioned waterboarding in the case if there was going to be 
an imminent terrorist attack. And if we had to find out information quickly, I wouldn't take anything off the table to ensure that British women, men and children are kept safe. Is that not rather extreme? <laughs> the lady at no, the front. No, no, Joe, I'll tell you what's extreme. Mm. People going into uh, the, the Manchester arena and blowing themselves up with a nail bomb and killing 22 uh, women and children. So will someone, driving, someone driving a van last night down Westminster Bridge and mowing people over. That's extreme. That's the problem. That's what needs to be cut out. Lady at the front. Uh, Mr. Lasso, hi. Um, I think it's notable that you attempt to distinguish between Islam and Islamism, and, mm. and thank you for, for putting that into the narrative. But um, how do you, your over-dependence on prevent strategies and things and measures like that, how, does, how do you distinguish, for example, you've suggested removing the burqa, banning the burqa. Yeah. How, you're not drawing that distinction. Uh, no, you're I, grouping these people. No, I, I mean, that is a completely different thing. That's about integration, because one thing is clear at this moment in this country, and this is proven by reports by Trevor Phillips, it's, it's proven by reports by Dame Louise Casey, we're actually becoming a more divided society, and people aren't Thanks integrating. No, it's not to, no, it's nothing to do. It's actually, it's actually nothing to do with my rhetoric. It's basically down to the failed ideology of multiculturalism. That's the problem whereby, whereby communities are encouraged to live alongside each other but never necessarily have to mix. I'll give you a statistic. It can't be right that 22% of Muslim women in Britain either don't speak English or speak very little English. And if you're talking about the banning of face coverings, it's not just about the burqa and the niqab. We want to ban face coverings in general. So if people turn up at an EDL march, for example, they shouldn't be allowed to cover their face. All right. but as for the, hang on, but as for the, the niqab and the burqa, look, if, I would argue two things. One, it's about security. There are numerous examples of people escaping after terrorist attacks or killings wearing the niqab or the burqa. And whether we like it or not, we're the most watched people in the world. There's more CCTV in Britain per head than anywhere on the planet. And for CCTV to be effective, you need to be able to see people's faces. Now, secondly, it's also about integration. And I would argue that to enjoy the full fruits of British society and to communicate properly, you have to be prepared to show so your face. So how does prevent right. integrate Hang on, we're going to go get some more comments. But interestingly, in France, of course, they've banned the burqa and they have suffered some terrible terrorist incidents. Um, the, lady here, the lady here at the front will take some more comments from the um, audience. Prevent has been widely criticised for alienating communities. Um, and I just wonder whether some of your rhetoric and the way in which you speak about Islam is in itself inciting radicalization because I know that if I was a Muslim sitting in this audience, I wouldn't feel particularly comfortable with some of the sweeping statements that you make. Well, well, actually, I'm not saying anything negative about Islam. I'm saying negative things about Islamism. And it's Islamism which breeds this idea, these people who hate us and want to kill us, right? And we've got to do something about it. We've so got to say to these people, do? Islamism is not welcome in Britain and we'll no longer turn a blind eye to it. I was glad today to hear Theresa May finally say, enough is enough. We can't allow this to continue. We've got to cut this out. And that means, as I say, put, right. more, put more police on the streets. It means radicalization is rife within prisons as well. We know this. It means putting more uh, prison officers, 7,000 more prison officers, 4,000 more border guards. We've got to ensure that our own people are safe. All right, Paul Luttrell, let's just take another comment from the man in the middle here. Going back to your integration policy, where I think you've mentioned that where the perpetrators of sex grooming gangs are continually targeting girls from outside their community, why do you think the UK political parties are so shy of noticing this pattern where the victims are almost always white girls, Sikh girls and Hindu girls and the grooming gangs are almost always from a particular section of the community, i.e. Pakistani Muslims. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right and it's because of political correctness. You're, other political parties... <laughs> other political parties and local authorities have turned a blind eye for this for far too long and we end up in a situation like Rotherham, where we've had 1,400 girls who've been either groomed or raped or gone through terrible, terrible things. The fact is, because of political correctness, we've said nothing and we've turned a blind eye. The point is, I would argue that religion and race 
in these circumstances, should be an aggravating factor when these cases go to court. Right. So you actually want... Because these people have been through the criminal justice system and they were convicted in the cases that you said. What do you yeah. want to do further? You want to make their religion... Well, in future... Well, well, actually, religion and race, in other cases, are an aggravating factor, but, again, when it comes to these grooming gangs, it hasn't been, and it is wrong. These girls are being picked generally because they're Hindu, they're Sikh, but predominantly they're white and they're Christian. These girls aren't being groomed from within the Muslim community. The gentleman with the hat there, please. Hello there, Paul. Uh, well, my name is Kamal Mohammed, and you can guess what my religion is. Um, on behalf of the, the Bristol community, Sudanese, uh, Sudanese and Muslim community in general, let me just condemn the, the uh, horrible and appalling attack that happened in London last night because they do not... <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad to hear, uh, to hear you talking uh, positively about the Muslim community, but you also talked about trust, building trust with the Muslim community in order to tackle um, extremism. You like figures and numbers. Well, there, there's a, reason, a, a recent research conducted by Professor Madud from the University of Bristol that says if you're a Muslim, a qualified Muslim with a degree, there's, you, three, you have three times less chance to get a job that a white person can get. And that is a research, and you love figures. How, what can you do to tackle institutional racism? Do you, you want to build trust between us? Tell me now how you're going to tackle institutional racism. <laughs> Well, I'm not, I'm not aware of that piece of research. If it is correct, uh, then it is wrong. I mean, I'll give you another statistic, 16%. Well, hang on, answer, of... answer that statistic. How would you deal with racism or communities who feel they're marginalised? Uh, well, look, again, this is all about integration, isn't it? It's all about bringing people together. And you think it's telling, all women, about... telling Muslim women to not wear the burqa and the niqab will help that integration? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do, because actually you'll be able to see people's faces and be able to communicate properly. No, it's, not it's quite important. But, but, but no, no, no. But what I also want to say is you've given that statistic. The other statistic on this is that 58% of Muslim women are economically inactive, 16% are unemployed. Because you're not giving and them again, jobs. And again, That's what no, no, but I would argue. I, but, but I would argue, in a sense, you're probably right to a point, but there's also an issue around integration and Muslim women being, able to, being willing to put themselves forward for jobs. And again, the burqa and the niqab precludes Muslim women from taking many forms of employment. The burqa has got nothing to do with well, it does. this. You can't be a nurse. The, the research was there. conducted by the BBC. OK, so BBC and the University of Bristol, and invite you, and invite you to look at it. Right, let me go on to the next um, question. Let's go to Leila King. Um, do, um, do UKIP um, and your kind of general rhetoric and policy, do you bear some responsibility for the rise in UK terrorism? And, and, and... Um, was it a sincere and um, appropriate gesture to be the only party who did not suspend your election campaigning following last night's attack? Hey. <laughs> well, obviously the Greens haven't because you've just had the Green uh, co-leader on this platform as well. Um, but what I will say is it was an act of defiance. These people hate our democracy. What a great way to say you will not beat us by ensuring that our general election takes place, OK? And it continues. Look, What about look, your rhetoric in terms of rhetoric, leading our, to radicalisation? No, our, our rhetoric isn't leading to radicalisation. What's leading to radicalisation are places like Saudi Arabia and Qatar spreading Islamism all over the globe. So why did one, one, one of your MEPs, Gerard Batten, call Islam, not Islamism, he called mm. Islam a death cult. He also said it's a barbaric religion. Yeah. Do you think that helps community cohesion? Uh, no, no, I don't. And, and actually, I think Gerard has got his terminology wrong. What I've said, and I've made perfectly clear, that extremist Islamism is a problem that we have, and that's the language I use. I'll just go back to the questioner, um, Leila, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the audience. 
Um, well, yeah, I mean, going back to one of the issues that you brought up a moment ago, Paul, um, in terms of the, the religious headdress. Now, whether or not in a separate context you think that this is a kind of practical, intangible um, request of a society, that they should have their face visible at all times, can you not see how bringing up these kind of personal, alienating, culturally judgmental points, that it, it does alienate people? Now, just all to right. give you... Let, let, him, give let you him answer, because we need to get other people... <coughs> In. Go on, Paul. Well, do you know what? This is going to happen anyway, OK? It's already happened in France, it's happened in Belgium, it's happened in Bulgaria, it's happened in the city You're of Barcelona. You're the only party proposing it here. Yeah, yeah, hold on, Joe, hold on, hold on, right? It's going to happen in Germany eventually. Angela Merkel's already talking about it. Um, it's, happen it's going to happen in Austria, it's going to happen in Holland. We can either be on the curve with this one right. or behind the curve. Let's go to the lady here. Hello, thank you. Uh, Paul, uh, one law for all, that's what... I would like in this country and whilst we've got Sharia law um, saying one thing and our law saying another I think you're going to have complete division forever and ever until we have one law for all we'll all know what's good we'll all know what's bad and then move on from there yeah I tend to agree and I don't I don't agree with Sharia councils and Sharia courts because I don't think there's any place in British society today for a court or a council where the word of a woman is only half that of a man. We're going to have to move on to some of the other questions. Just to be clear, of course, there is only one law in this country. There may be Sharia courts, but there is only one law that which, is in the eyes the, of the judge. all the secondary marks. Um, you know, but just to make it clear, can we go to the next questioner, please, Andrew Carnegie? Andrew, where are you? There. Uh, UKIP proposed to defend the NHS yet a significant proportion of the staff who work there are immigrants. Yeah. Um, surely the greatest danger to the NHS is UKIP and Brexit. <laughs> uh, no, it's not a danger, actually, because what we would like to see is there's 167,000 EU migrants who work in the NHS at this present moment in time. I'd like to see the government, on, on the day that it's elected, on June the 9th, turn around to these people and say, right, you provide a great job for our NHS, you're good for the economy, you can't stay. Simple as that, OK? As for UKIP being bad for the NHS, we're the party which is offering the best deal for the NHS out of any of the political parties. And do you know why? Because we're prepared to look at other priorities. We would like to see the foreign aid budget, which is costing the British people £30 million every single day. Slash, slash it, slash it. OK? You slash, right, it, finish. you slash it and we would save £11 billion a year. That money can then be transferred directly into social care and into the NHS. Uh, what, sorry, what level okay. do you want to cut it to? In your manifesto, you say you want to cut the foreign aid budget yeah. to 0.2%. 0.2% of the That won't GNA. save £11 billion. Pounds. The foreign aid budget is about £12 to £13 billion. Pounds. Yes, but it, no, it will save £11 billion pounds by the end of this term because it's due to go up year on year. Now, even if we cut it, to 0.2% of GNI. That is the same level as what America was paying under the Obama administration. And no one would suggest that America under Obama wasn't charitable. It's still, it's still more than Spain and Portugal put together. I'm sorry, we know from research and, and open polling, by the way, that the vast majority of people agree with us on this issue. Cut the foreign aid budget and spend British taxpayers' money Except on the NHS. Again. All the other parties have signed up to that 0.7% commitment. Yeah, but they're wrong. Um, the gentleman there. Yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, you're talking complete rubbish. Um, <laughs> the, uh, somebody over there talked about institutional racism, um, and you represent it. You, oh, you're, you're, on. You're, I'm sorry. But, uh, you're, 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 oh, listen, the, the health service has a huge number of people who are being affected by your approach to our society. What, um, because I want to see the foreign aid budget cut? No, no, because you are um, uh, uh, coming across as a polemic darkness in the way that we see ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but you are. You, you, you're, tra you're talking about waterboarding, as an example. You're talking about dragging us back to a lower level. I'm talking and about we are better than that. No, we no, have a no, 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 no. 
I'm talking, sir. I'm talking, sir. About protecting and not to be dragged down to where you are. I'm talking about protecting British citizens and ensuring. You know, I'll give you an example. We're spending, we're spending foreign aid. We're giving foreign aid to a country like India, which has more millionaires and billionaires than ourselves. A country which has its own space programme. A country which has its own nuclear weapons, its own aircraft carriers. I'm sorry. Charity begins at home in this yeah. 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 Hang on. If your, can I just say, if, your, if your policies were so popular, Paul Nuttall, why have you done so spectacularly badly in recent elections, in the local elections, in the by-election in Stoke? <laughs> Well, you say... have a legitimate basis to put forward your policies, but they are yeah. not popular. People have not voted for you. Well, firstly, I wouldn't say the Stoke by-election was spectacularly bad. We cut Labour's majority in half. As for the local no, elections... I said about the local elections no, no, was spectacularly you mentioned bad. Both. And Stoke by-election. Okay. Well, you were supposed well, to win it. Well, hang on. <laughs> With the local elections, we always knew that they were going to be the most difficult in UKIP's history. What UKIP has done is it's won the war in many ways getting the referendum yeah. and getting Brexit. Now what we've got to do is yeah. win the peace. And why you keep so important, Joe, is because we have to be the country's insurance policy. I think Theresa May is going to win this election, all right? And I, I do, but however, I do not trust her to get a good deal for Britain when she needs to go into these negotiations. Therefore, UKIP right. has to be there of the, to be the guard dogs of the Brexit that we voted for on June the 23rd let's go to last the, year. Let's go to the lady there with the glasses on, please. You just mentioned that you've won the war. Presumably you mean Brexit. That's what UKIP was for. Why do we still need UKIP? Well, for two reasons, really. I mean, I've, I've basically just made one of the points. You know, I am not convinced whoever is Prime Minister, and I do think it will be Theresa May, will go out and negotiate hard enough for us to get the British deal. Now, let me just, let, let me just make this point. If it wasn't for UKIP back in 2013, there wouldn't have been a referendum in the first place. We forced a then British Prime Minister, David Cameron, who never wanted to give a referendum, into giving one in the first place. And that's why UKIP, that proves how important UKIP can be. If UKIP is on the pitch, if UKIP is strong, if it's going up in the polls, if it's winning local elections... But it's not, it, that's my point. I, hold on, but sometimes, Joe, you know, you know in politics, the tide comes in, the tide goes out. Mm. It'll come back in again. And if UKIP is there and it's strong, we can right. ensure that we are the Prime Minister's backbone Let to get the kind of Brexit deal that we want. Let me now, go to secondly, the lady at the back in the corner. Secondly, it's also important that UKIP is around because we drive the political agenda. We make the political right. weather Let in many ways. Well, well actually, Let you know, people laughed at us within the Westminster bubble because they felt a bit uncomfortable about our integration agenda. Theresa May is now talking our language. Ten years ago when we spoke about Brexit, People laughed at us All and right. said it was lunacy. Well, let's get when we spoke more, about a points-based system, when we spoke about a points-based system on immigration, well, people said it was racist. It's now government policy well, for non-EU migrants. Well, hang on. Hang on. What is your immigration system now? You want a one-in, yes. one-out policy? That is a gimmick, isn't it? No, it's not a gimmick. It's not it a, gimmick. a gimmick. It's not a gimmick. Hold on. You, before you go, yeah, there, yeah, you no, got, let well, me yes, but I do need to get some audience in. But go and answer that. Well, look, this is a policy called balanced migration. It was first proposed by Frank Field, the Labour MP for Birkenhead. It was supported by Nicholas Soames, the Tory MP. It basically goes like this. We want to see zero net immigration mm -hmm. over the next five years. So, for example, last year, 339,000 people left Britain. That means we would let in the same sort of number. However, there would also be an Australian points-based system, so what we would get into the country are skilled migrants, skilled migrants who'd add to the economy, add to the tax receipt, it'd be good for British wages and it would be good for social cohesion right. in the economy Let, all around. Let's, I mean, just before we go to that lady, I mean, just to be checked, so it, however many doctors or high-tech specialists we might need, they yeah. couldn't come to the UK unless somebody left. But it wouldn't be 339,000 that we'd need. Right, but that wasn't the question I asked. No, I'm but saying, that's, but that's the point. would you have to wait for someone that's to leave before you get a doctor in? No, that's the point. It's done over a five-year period, not a one-year period. Therefore, there's a lot of rigour room. But what, we're not, what we're saying isn't zero gross immigration, we're not pulling up the drawbridge, we'd still be letting in around 300,000 a year, but what we would be letting in is skilled migrants, 300,000 a year, so not the tens of thousands even on net migration? Well, well, look, I mean, this is all about... No, it's zero net migration. Net, not gross. No, net. The lady at the back. 
Um, so coming back to the point about um, NHS staffing shortages and your evident pride in Brexit, yeah. what's your response to figures like that conducted by the Royal College of Nursing over two months ago that said since Brexit there's been a 92% decrease in the number of EU migrants registering to be nurses in the UK? It's not a fact about drawing up the drawbridge, it's people not now wanting to come to the UK. Yeah, but the, the, the majority of nurses within the NHS are uh, obviously are British, but then the next... Uh, the next on the list are obviously non-EU migrants. Now, what we need to do is, yeah, we need to start training our own yeah. nurses up. Right. It cannot, okay. it cannot be right let me... or fair that we're taking nurses All right, from countries in Africa, for example, where one in three people have HIV. And, and we'll ask in a moment how bad. long that would take. Of course, some people say up to ten years. Well, no, the lady at the no, front. We are, ta we are taking nurses from some countries in Africa. No. No I, didn't, no, I didn't say that. I said it's not fair that we're taking nurses from these countries when, quite frankly, they're obviously needed in their I'm country. I'm going to take a final, final um, comment from the audience before we move on. This lady here. So I'm just wondering what your response is to all the economists and actually the companies that are going to pull uh, a lot of jobs out of the UK after um, Brexit. And also the fact that there's a lot of studies that show that immigration is economically you know, beneficial for the UK. So do you not think that you're just pursuing ideology for ideology's sake and cutting immigration and, and Brexit? Uh, 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 no, no. What a lot of these reports haven't taken into account, and the Office for Budget Responsibility admit this in their report, which keeps getting quoted at me, that this policy had cost £6 billion a year. They admit in that report that they haven't taken into account population growth. So, for example, last year, we allowed in net a city the size of Hull. It's going to be a Birmingham every four years. It means that by the middle of this century, we'll have a population of 80 million people. That means there'll have to be a new hospital building programme a new school building programme, new motorways, well, a new good. rail network. If you take into how much that's going to cost yeah, in capital investment... Yeah, surely, or the building of all these new institutions. I mean, how on. are you against this? Hang on. <laughs> if you take into account the cost of the capital investment which will have to go into keeping up with population, it's going to be massive. All right. We need to control the population. The only way you do that is through balanced migration. Let's go to the next questioner, Joanna Flanagan, with your question. Bearing in mind that you are supportive of Trump pulling out of the climate change talks, do you believe in climate change? Well, firstly, firstly, I mean, I didn't support Donald Trump during his election. I think some of the things that he said, specifically regarding women, went way above and beyond the pale. However, how, how, hold on. Well, well, yeah, actually, yeah, I, I don't think this Muslim ban is going to work in any way, shape or form. I don't think it's right. However, what I will say is he's actually only doing what he said he was going to do. I mean, if he didn't, what is the point producing a manifesto or a programme? Here is someone who's been elected in a democracy and is carrying out the will of the people. He right. said, he Let said, let me finish. No, 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 I'm going to come back to that. He said... Do you believe in climate change? Yes, I, of course I believe the climate's changing. Right. You do believe... And who's responsible? Uh, well, a whole, a whole load of different factors. Right, a whole including, load of different including factors. man-made climate change. Yeah, man obviously plays some role okay. in the changing of the climate. However, however, I don't buy into the climate alarmist agenda. All right, I'm going to have to take... We're running out of time. The gentleman at the very back there, a brief comment. Uh, you've just said that uh, people should stand by their manifestos. Yeah. And you've been, you introduced it by saying that you uh, supported British values, one of which I thought was habeas corpus. Um, when you went on to talk about detention without trial and so on, um, it reminded me of Bonhoeffer's thing about the Nazis, that when they came for the Jews, I did nothing because I wasn't right. a Jew. When they went for the communists... It has to be very brief, the answer, because we're running out of time. And when they came for me, there was no one left. When are we going to realise... There is a group of people in this country, MI5, say 23,000, who hate who we are, hate who we live, and want to kill us. What right. I want to do is ensure that things like Manchester and London last night do Paul not Nuttall. become commonplace in this country. Right, we have to say goodbye to Paul Nuttall and thank you. Please show your appreciation. Paul Nuttall, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the audience from all of us here. Good night.